Welcome to the weekly sermon at Church of the Resurrection. We're glad that you're here. Resurrection is a place where kids, students, and adults find a safe, authentic, and welcoming community where everyone belongs. If you don't have a church family, we'd like to invite you to join us for worship online at core.org slash live or in person at any of our locations in the Kansas City area. You can learn more about us at core.org. We pray that God will use this message to help you grow in your faith journey and inspire you to make a difference in the world around you. As we continue in worship, we turn our attention to the reading of scripture. Today, we read several passages written by Paul to the early church pertaining to the Holy Spirit. And we're going to begin today by reading from Romans, the eighth chapter. This is what we read. If the spirit of the one who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you, the one who raised Christ from the dead will give life to your human bodies also through his spirit that lives in you. And then from Galatians, the fifth chapter, we read this. The fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And then from 1 Corinthians chapter 12, we read this. Brothers and sisters, I don't want you to be ignorant about spiritual gifts. And then finally, again, from Romans, the eighth chapter, we read, for all who are led by the spirit of God are children of God. May God add a blessing to the reading, hearing, and understanding of these scriptures. When I turned 60 in July, I had uh, family members and some friends who sent gifts to the house and cards and gifts. And, and, uh, and I opened up, I thought I opened all of them up, but, uh, but a month later, I was cleaning some things up in our mudroom and somehow uh, something had got, a card had gotten stuffed underneath some other stacks of books that I had there. And, and I found it. Uh, there it had sat for a month. And when I opened it up, it was a really meaningful card. Uh, the note was beautiful and, and touched my heart. And there was a gift card to go out to one of my favorite restaurants. And uh, here's the thing, this gift had been given to me on my birthday, but I had failed to recognize it and failed to open it up. So it was really of no use to me until I finally found it and I opened it up. And in a sense, that's what we've been trying to do over this last month in talking about the Holy Spirit. The Bible says that we have this gift of the Holy Spirit available to us, that God has given us this gift of the Spirit, that if you are a Christian, you have the Spirit in you already, but if we don't know about it, if we don't understand it or know how to open the gift or how to take advantage of it or how to tap into it, then it's virtually worthless to us. And so my hope has been over these last four weeks as we've studied the Holy Spirit to help you know who is the Holy Spirit, what does the Holy Spirit do and how do we take advantage of, how do we avail ourselves of the gift of the Holy Spirit? We started in week one by looking at the Holy Spirit in the Hebrew Bible and seeing what do we find in the entire Old Testament? What does it teach us about the Spirit of God? Then we came to the Gospels and we wanted to know what does Jesus have to say about the Holy Spirit? Then we turned last week to the Acts of the Apostles and Pastor Scott preached a great sermon on the power of the Holy Spirit that came on the day of Pentecost and what happened in the early church, how the Holy Spirit was at work in the early church. Today, we're going to turn to the letters of Paul, actually the letters of the New Testament, but we're going to focus primarily on Paul's letters. And we're going to try to see in the earliest part of the New Testament. So remember, Paul's letters are written somewhere between 50 and 65 AD. The Gospel of Mark is written maybe around 65 to 70, maybe a little after that. And the other Gospels are written later than that. And the Acts of the Apostles probably around 80, 85. And so the earliest portion of our New Testament is the letters of Paul. And we're going to try to see what did Paul say about the Holy Spirit? This is his pastoral advice to congregations so that they might know who is the Holy Spirit and how do they avail themselves of the Holy Spirit's power, the very thing we're trying to ask and answer in this sermon series. And so as we prepare to do that, I want you to know that in, uh, in Paul's letters, he speaks about the Holy Spirit 110 times. So it's not like a minor theme in Paul's notes. It is a major theme in Paul's letters. And it should be, that's indicative of the fact that this should be a major theme for us as Christians as well, that the Holy Spirit is an important part, an essential part of the Christian life. And this gift is ours to open and to uh, take advantage of and to allow the Spirit to have the Spirit's way in our lives. 
All right, I wanna begin uh, just with a brief note, and that is that as Christians, we think of God in Trinitarian terms. So we think of God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. We think of a God, first of all, one God, only one stuff of God, one divine essence, and yet three distinct persons, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And so we speak of God the Father as the creator of all things, the source of all things. We think of Jesus who puts on flesh, who is God taking on flesh and walking among us, putting a face to God so that when we read about Jesus and we see what he says and what he does, we and, and his, ultimately his death and resurrection, we're seeing something about God in some profound way that we can relate to as human beings. And so we look at him and we say, Jesus is God, the son who is the redeemer. And then when we speak about the Holy Spirit, and I want to make sure, in fact, I'm going to ask you to join me in this. Uh, When we speak about the Holy Spirit, we speak about the Holy Spirit. If you'll say this with me, the Holy Spirit is God's presence and power actively at work in our lives and in the world. Let's say that again. The Holy Spirit is God's presence and power actively at work in our lives and in the world. That's a profound statement. The Holy Spirit, we've been talking about these four weeks, is God's presence and power actively at work in our lives and in the world. I want you to remember that. All right, so on Easter, Jesus, Easter evening in John's gospel, Jesus breathes on his disciples. And remember the word spirit also means breath. And so Jesus breathes on his disciples and he says, receive the Holy Spirit. On the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit filled all the disciples in the upper room. They were filled with the Holy Spirit. And so there's this idea we have already in the Gospels and the book of Acts that the Holy Spirit is given as a gift to those who trust in Christ. And this is what we find in Paul as well. The assumption in Paul is that Christians have the Holy Spirit in them. So listen to these words. The Spirit of the one who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you. His Spirit that lives in you. Twice in this one verse, Paul makes clear that Christians have the Holy Spirit taking up residence inside of them. Now, if we try to ask, well, where exactly is the Holy Spirit residing in us? Well, the Holy Spirit is everywhere. We're really talking about opening ourselves up to the Holy Spirit's work. The Holy Spirit is there and our understanding, the Spirit is within us and then tapping into the Spirit's work in our lives. Now, this is the same spirit that parted the Red Sea. It's the same spirit who gave Bezalel or Bezalel and Oliab the gifts to be able to create the beautiful things in the tabernacle or the tent of meeting. It is the same spirit who rushed upon Samson when he was being attacked by a wild lion and made it possible for him to rip the lion apart limb by limb. It's the same spirit who gave courage to the judges of Israel to take on Israel's enemies, even though they were vastly outnumbered. It is the same spirit who came upon David, though he was just a shepherd boy, and equipped him with the gifts to be able to lead as the greatest king Israel would ever know for a period of 40 years. It's the same spirit who came upon the prophets and and led them to feel like there was a fire pent up in their bones where they had the courage to speak truth to power and to speak about justice and the judgment of God and also the comfort of God. That same spirit, it's the same spirit who came upon Jesus when he was baptized, the same spirit who drove him into the wilderness, the same spirit that Jesus said would be like living water inside our souls, the same spirit Jesus promised would be our advocate, our helper, our comforter, our counselor, our friend, our defender. The same spirit that came upon those disciples like a rushing violent wind and and flames of fire and filled them so that they could speak in other languages as the Spirit guided them and directed them. That Spirit is the Spirit that lives in you and lives in me. That Spirit, the Spirit who raised Jesus from the dead, Paul says, lives in our mortal bodies and will give us our mortal bodies life. This is what we're talking about. So imagine having access to that gift and not choosing to open it, right? We need the Holy Spirit. We were made for the Holy Spirit. God has given us the gift of his Spirit. And so in this sermon series, my hope has been that you would say daily that this would become a part of your life every morning to be able to say, Holy Spirit, come, fill me, use me, guide me, shape me, form me, make me the person you want me to be. All right, when, uh, when, I think about, uh, when I think about the Holy Spirit and living life with or without the Holy Spirit, so you have the Holy Spirit, it's up to you whether you're gonna take advantage of that, right? So the Holy Spirit will not force uh, the Spirit on you. It will not force you to take advantage of the Spirit's power. That's a decision that you make. And so I was thinking about uh, many times I've traveled through airports across America and actually internationally, sometimes been in cities where they have subways and you're down at the bottom of the subway. Maybe you took the train from the airport to the subway and you got a suitcase with you. And often when you're in the airport or at a subway, there are two options. There is an escalator and there's a set of stairs like this picture you see here. So we have a choice between taking the escalator and we can take the escalator or we can take the stairs. Now, if you think about that, there are times where I just need the extra steps and I'm not just exhausted and I'm gonna take the steps. You know, it's good exercise to take the steps. 
but I can take the escalator and still walk up the steps on the left-hand side and get exercise and get up the steps twice as fast. Now, the steps and the escalator are going to take me to the same place. But if I'm exhausted or if I have a suitcase, I'm taking the escalator because it's, it's really using power, not my power, but there's another power from outside of me that's going to carry me up those steps. So again, you have a choice. Uh, one choice would be if you've got a heavy suitcase, you can walk up the steps like this fellow here who's walking up the steps. And I don't know, I've, been, I've felt like that guy sometimes and trying to make his way up at the train station, trying to get up to the top, carrying that step. And so you feel the burden of carrying that. Or you could be like this woman who's smart enough to take the escalator, take a look. And so there's no effort exerted in that. Her back's not hurting her in any way. She's just carefully, you know, just easily being lifted up to that upper level where she needs to be. And that gives you a picture of the choice between living life without the Holy Spirit's power and living life according to the Holy Spirit's power. Now, the Holy Spirit's power doesn't come usually like a rushing violent wind, as we talk about on the day of Pentecost, but often as a gentle breeze into our lives, a gentle nudge into our lives. All right, so that, with that picture of the escalators and, and either taking the stairs and carrying your baggage up the stairs or taking advantage of the Spirit's power by walking in the escalator, I want us to talk just a little bit more about how the Spirit works in our lives according to the Apostle Paul. So in Paul's letters, Paul often makes a distinction between a life lived according to the flesh and life lived according to the spirit or according to selfish desires versus the spirit's desires. So in Romans 8, 6, Paul says this, the attitude that comes from selfishness leads to death, but the attitude that comes from the spirit leads to life and peace. So here he's saying uh, our innermost being can be shaped either by our own selfish desires or by the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit's in you. And if you'll allow the Holy Spirit to shape you, the Holy Spirit will do just that. Now, the Greek word for attitude here is a phroneme, a phroneme. And phroneme means, uh, in essence, innermost being. I, I love this definition, visceral thoughts, right? It, it's, it's what's going on deep inside of you. And that deep inside of you, that attitude, that phroneme, can be shaped by the Spirit or they can be shaped by your own selfish attitudes. And you've got to decide, will I invite the Holy Spirit to reshape me like a potter shapes the clay, or am I going to live according to my own basic nature, and our basic nature has some good in it. And we're also people who struggle as humans. We struggle with sin. In Galatians, Paul says this. So we've heard from Romans. In Galatians 5, 16 and 17, he picks up the same idea. He says, I say, be guided by the Spirit and you won't carry out your selfish desires. A person's selfish desires are set against the Spirit and the Spirit is set against one's selfish desires. They are opposed to each other. And we all know selfish desires. I have selfish desires. You have selfish desires. Attitudes in the heart that probably aren't quite right. And so we, we're, in, we're determining whether we're going to be opening our, our spirit, our attitudes, our phroneme to the Holy Spirit, or we're going to allow them to be shaped by our own selfish desires. Now, a few verses down, Paul describes what these selfish desires look like. He says, the actions that are produced by selfish motives are obvious, since they include sexual immorality, moral corruption, doing whatever feels good, idolatry, drug use and casting spells, hate, fighting, obsession, losing your temper, competitive opposition, conflict, selfishness, group rivalry, jealousy, drunkenness, partying, and other things like that. Now you read that list and he's writing this in the first century Roman empire, but he could be writing this in 21st century America, right? I mean, everything on that list sounds like the things that we wrestle with today. So to use the escalator metaphor again, to be led by selfish desires, is not just to not take advantage of the Spirit's power, it's to actively oppose where the Spirit would lead you. And in that, I find an interesting picture. There's a, uh, in this video, you're about to see a woman who's decided to go uh, the wrong direction on an escalator. Take a look. And this paints a picture for me. I have no idea why she started trying to do this, but it paints a picture for me of what happens when we start walking against the direction the Spirit would try to lead us in our lives. And it gets harder and harder and harder. And sometimes we slip and fall because we're going against the grain or against the wind of the Holy Spirit. And that happens often in our lives when we are living according to selfish desires. It's not just that we're not taking advantage of the Spirit's help. We're actually opposing the Spirit. So Paul says selfish desires are opposed to the attitude that the Spirit would have in our lives. So then Paul says again that we're to be guided by the Spirit. And when we're guided by the Spirit, this is what he says it looks like. It's not all those things I just described. Instead, he says in a very famous passage in Galatians 5, 22 and 23, a passage we've memorized here at Resurrection Before, he says the fruit of the Spirit, not the selfish desires, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, 
kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. I'll tell you, there's many times I just take the fruit of the Spirit. And if you don't have it memorized, you can take your pocket testament, if you have one of those, and just open up to Galatians 5, 22 and 23. When I'm out walking, sometimes while I'm walking, I just start praying that passage. Oh, Holy Spirit, please produce these fruit in my life. Please help me to become like this. And you see, the more that we pray, it's interesting how prayer works. Prayer is surrendering ourselves to God's will. Prayer is fixing the desires of our heart on what we're praying for. And so when I begin to pray for God to give me these fruit of the Spirit, to produce these in me, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control, the more I pray it, the more my heart wants it, the more I'm open to the Spirit working, and the more it happens in our lives. Last year, David Brooks wrote a piece for The Atlantic entitled, How America Got Mean. And he noticed that we're less generous today in America than we were just a few years ago. He noted that, uh, that Americans are increasingly, uh, he says, he describes it this way, Americans are increasingly sad, alienated, and rude. Sad, alienated, and rude. And what a wonderful world it would be if our phroneme was uh, shaped by the Holy Spirit, producing love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, goodness, faithfulness, and self-control than all of the other things that are produced when we're only giving in to our natural selves. And we see that come out in the political season, right? During the, the, looking at the commercials and everything else, we see the worst of ourselves as humans coming out many times, not the best of ourselves how we need to be led by the Holy Spirit. This is key. It's key to, help, to living in a world where people aren't mean and sad and, and, uh, and unhappy all the time. All right, so that leads me to think about the empowered ministry that happens from the Holy Spirit. So if you are a follower of Christ, you're called to ministry. Uh, I am not your minister. I am a pastor. And I am a minister of Christ, just like you are a minister of Christ. And to be a minister means to be a servant. And our task is, as we're living for Christ, is to daily be in ministry, to daily look around and see who needs something for me today, who needs help, encouragement, kindness, compassion, who needs the fruit of the Spirit, evidence in my life for them. So Paul writes this in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, he talks about the Holy Spirit equips us with gifts for ministry, for us to be able to care for one another and to be the church for each other and for the world. And he says this, brothers and sisters, I don't want you to be ignorant about spiritual gifts. There are spiritual gifts, different spiritual gifts, but the same spirit. And there are different ministries and the same Lord. And there are different activities, but the same God who produces all of them in every one. And then he says, a demonstration of the spirit is given to each person for the common good. Now, just as God's spirit gave Bezalel and Oholiab artistic gifts and David the gifts to lead, the Holy Spirit still gives gifts to us today. And in the Old Testament, it was primarily given for just special purposes for just a few people. But today we believe the Holy Spirit is available to all of us and longs to give gifts to each of us to make us beneficial to other people. Do you realize that, that you are actually called by Jesus to benefit other people's lives? And in fact, the more you think about being a benefit, a blessing, ministering to and serving other people, the more happy you find yourself, which is what Jesus was saying when he says, those who lose their lives will find it and those who find their lives uh, will lose them. We, We find life when we're living into what we were created for, which is to be a blessing, which is to love one another, to care for one another, all of these things. And the Holy Spirit helps us. And, you know, we have unique gifts and abilities that, were, that are, you know, they're innate to us. Some of those things came from our parents and our genetics. Some of them came from the life that, you know, we've lived as we were growing up and our life experiences. Some of them came from the things that we learned in school or the, or the skills and abilities we have in the workplace. But some of those things are unique gifts from the Holy Spirit poured into us so that we might be useful to God and to other people. So in Romans 12, 6 through 8, we read about some pretty ordinary gifts. Paul writes, we have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, prophecy in proportion to faith, ministry in ministering, the teacher in teaching, the exhorter in in exhortation, the giver in generosity, the leader in diligence, the compassionate in cheerfulness. I like that list of gifts because they're pretty easy to understand. I mean, prophecy is speaking the truth uh, to power or speaking, you know, speaking hard words when they need to be spoken. But, uh, but the other ones are pretty easy to understand. Ministry, that is serving, teaching, Uh, exhorting. Actually, interesting, the word exhortation is the same word paraclete that Jesus uses to describe the Holy Spirit. It's to come alongside somebody and to encourage them. And and then giving and generosity and leadership and compassion. I mean, you have one or more of those gifts that the Holy Spirit has given you that you are uniquely able to exercise in ways that some other people cannot. I wonder if you know which of those gifts you have. 
And, and then uh, Paul goes on to say in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 8 through 10, he describes another set of gifts. Uh, some have some overlap, but these are sometimes called the ecstatic gifts. So if you think of ecstasy, the sense of, you know, of just being overwhelmed by the Spirit's power, some think of this list in that way. And so he says, uh, to some are given a word of wisdom by the Spirit, uh, a word of knowledge to another according to the same spirit, faith to still another uh, to still another by the same spirit, gifts of healing to another uh, in the one spirit, performance of miracles to another, prophecy to another, the ability to tell spirits apart from one another, different kinds of tongues to another, and the interpretation of tongues to another. Now, some of these gifts sound kind of spooky, speaking in tongues, prophecy, uh, miracles, healing, discernment of spirits, but many of these are really not that, that unusual. Uh, so I'm going to suggest that you have had a word of, of wisdom somewhere along the way, sometime where there was a timely word you had to help somebody else based upon the wisdom that you had. Maybe the Holy Spirit put something on your heart to share with somebody else. You have had moments where you had a word of knowledge, where, where you sensed, you just knew, knew in your gut. And sometimes we call these God winks or, or God incidences or, or moments where the Spirit is just speaking to us, but where we know we need to call somebody at a particular time, or we feel a sense of intuition that we need to reach out to somebody or do this particular thing. And, and we find ourselves in the middle of what God wants us to do. These are not that unusual. When the Holy Spirit is activated in our lives, when we're allowing this Holy Spirit to work, we're going to find ourselves experiencing these and many other things. Now, I, I think about uh, gifts of healing and miracles. You say, well, I don't have a gift of healing and miracle. Maybe not, but there are times where we have prayed for people and for reasons we cannot understand, something happens in the answer to that prayer that's out of the ordinary. So usually God works in ordinary means in response to prayer, but sometimes something extraordinary happens. And maybe that was a part of the faith you had in that moment. Maybe it was just, you know, there was some purpose God had in bringing a healing to somebody. But I do think of more ordinary ways that God gives gifts of healing. And I think about a couple of our doctors, Dr. Hoxted and Dr. Tatros, and you see them in this picture here. They work at KU Med Center, and I love this. Uh, they asked for the logo for our Do Unto Others campaign, and they had their hats and their, and their uh, set of scrubs made up with that logo, stitched into that logo, or stitched with that logo. And I love, can you imagine if you're a part of Resurrection, or even if you're not, and your doctor walks in and they've got a heart on their, on their scrub hat, and they're, I don't even know what those are called, but they, they've got the, the heart on there and it says, Do Unto Others. I mean, I don't know, but certainly as a Resurrection member, if my doctor walked in with one of those, I feel peace immediately just seeing them walk in like that. But it's also a testimony, even while they're going into surgery, that we need to treat each other this way. As a medical team, as patients, all of us to do unto others as we'd have them do unto them, do unto us. And that is a picture of healing as well. Beautiful healing. So that's a gift of healing. All right, I want to chase a rabbit for just a second, if you'll allow me. So uh, tongues. Um, we hear about this here, speaking in tongues. Maybe you've been in a church where somebody spoke in tongues. You knew somebody who was Pentecostal or charismatic. They spoke in tongues. Last week, Pastor Scott talked about the day of Pentecost when the Jewish festival of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit came upon the believers and they, all, uh, they were filled with the Holy Spirit and they spoke in tongues. Now, that speaking in tongues were literal other languages. So there were people from all across the world who were in Jerusalem for the Feast of Pest, uh, Pentecost. And at that feast, Suddenly, people from different parts of the world heard the disciples speaking their languages, talking about Jesus in languages the disciples heretofore had not known. Now, that's a unique uh, gift of the Spirit. And that it, really, the backstory is going all the way back to Babel, where, where, the, uh, where the people, God you know, scattered the languages of all the people, and, and suddenly God, by the Spirit, is bringing people back together again. It's a whole sermon by itself. But, uh, but when we look at that story... Tongues there was not something, I mean, it was certainly way supernatural, way more supernatural than, than the normal tongues people experience in Pentecostal churches, but it wasn't some unknown language that nobody could understand or decipher. But in 1901, the modern Pentecostal movement was started. The Pentecostal and charismatic movements were started. Pentecostal first, that's, those are denominational churches typically, or churches focused on this. Charismatic tends to be the term used for churches in existing denominations that embrace the Holy Spirit's work in these uh, really ecstatic ways. So 56 miles uh, west of where I'm standing right now is Topeka, Kansas. And there was a man named Charles Parham who was a Methodist preacher who had sort of gotten, I think, a little disillusioned with the Methodist church because he felt like there was more to the Holy Spirit than what he was experiencing uh, when he was leading his churches. And so he was leading a Bible study or some kind of Bible class or something. And, and, and they were studying the book of Acts and they were saying, you know, look at how the Holy Spirit worked in the book of Acts. And they were filled with the Holy Spirit and they spoke in tongues. And then you find this repeated several times in the book of Acts where people were filled with the Holy Spirit and, and they spoke in tongues. 
And, and they began to say, he began to say, you know, I think we should maybe experience this today. Maybe we should seek this today. And, and pretty soon people in that study, you know, began to speak in other tongues. And, uh, and one of those students was a man named William Seymour in that class. William Seymour was African-American and he went to uh, California and he began to lead a revival there, Azusa Street Revival. And, and once more, people began to speak in tongues there. Uh, William Seymour is in our stained glass window here at Resurrection. And we included William Seymour in the window because we wanted to recognize how important the Pentecostal charismatic revival was in the 20th century and still ongoing today. 644 million Christians ended up being affected by or a part of the Pentecostal or charismatic movement. That's just huge. People had that experience of the Holy Spirit. And part of what it says is people were hungry to experience the Holy Spirit and their preachers weren't talking about it. Their churches were not helping people know how to avail themselves of the Holy Spirit's power in their lives. And then, you know, they would have these experiences and some would speak in tongues and some wouldn't, but they all wanted more of the Holy Spirit in their lives. I came to faith in Christ in a Pentecostal church. So I was an atheist and I was invited to this little Pentecostal church, Faith Chapel Assembly of God, a wonderful congregation of people. And they welcomed me and they loved me as a, as a 14-year-old kid who was doing drugs and drinking and they just welcomed and loved me. And, uh, and at first I was a little spooked by some of the ways that they spoke in tongues and other things. But after a while, I got kind of used to that and I, and I came to appreciate their authenticity and, and their passion, their spiritual passion. Now, last week I went back to that church where I came to faith in Christ. It's only about four miles from where I'm standing now. And I went to talk to their senior pastor, Bob Cave. Now, Bob was not my pastor when I was a kid, but Bob's been there for a long time. And, uh, and I love just walking through the church and remembering my first sermon I preached there and falling in love with my girlfriend, LaVon, who became my wife, and, and also my own experiences of the Holy Spirit in that church. And uh, Bob's a terrific guy. He's a very grounded guy. He has a master's in counseling and, uh, and has been leading this church for a number of years. And I thought you might enjoy hearing from a Pentecostal his experience of the Holy Spirit and of being baptized in the Holy Spirit and speaking in tongues. Take a listen. On an everyday basis, I, I rely on the Spirit of God to lead me and guide me, to give me direction. Um, I pray that the Spirit of God would um, en enliven um, to me the things that I need to hear for that day, for that moment, to bring people into my life and to give me the words to say to them. And if you know, there are, there are things that for me I know are from the Spirit of God, I wouldn't think of them myself. You know, and, and people I might encounter uh, in a way that I might encounter them that is just, I believe that the Lord leads that, that all of that through the Holy Spirit. Well, I went to church one day, invited by a girlfriend, and they were preaching salvation, and I had never heard this message before. Uh, I was in a Catholic neighborhood, so I knew Jesus was on the cross. I had no idea why he was there, what he did. Uh, I just knew I didn't want to do it, you know, whatever it was. Uh, and the next thing I know, as the pastor's preaching about Jesus, I feel what I later learned was a convicting of the Holy Spirit of my sin and my need for Jesus. And I came to Christ that morning, I walked up um, from the back of the church to the front of the church at the altar, prayed a prayer of salvation. And they asked me after I got saved, if I prayed that prayer, I said I did, and I was crying and it was powerful. My chains fell off, my sin was gone. It was an amazing feeling. I didn't think I could ever feel anything else besides that. And then they said, now I want you to pray that God would give you everything he has for you. I had no idea what that meant, so I did. And within about four seconds of asking for that, I began to speak in tongues in a language I'd never heard before. And something, I, it, it tickled me inside. And uh, I asked the guy when I was done, I said, did you hear that? And he said, yeah, that's the baptism of the Holy Spirit. That God has blessed you today. Just keep doing that. And he showed me a couple places in the Bible where it talked about baptism of the Spirit, speaking in tongues. So I go home to tell my ex-Baptist mother what happened. And um, I told her I got saved. She said, well, we'll see. And then I told her, I said, oh, and listen to this. And I started speaking in tongues. And she slapped me across the face and said, we don't do that here. I said, well, they do it at the church where I was just at. You know, I didn't do it, Mom. They didn't do it to me. The Lord did that to me. It is, it is a surrender. It is, it is us saying to the Lord, okay, Lord, you know, do what you want to do. Do whatever you want to do. I'm ready for that. And we are all filled with the Spirit of God. We all have the Holy Spirit. That is, the, again, the agent of salvation. Uh, Jesus is, the, is the, the way that we are saved and gives us the door for that. And the Holy Spirit facilitates that. So we are all filled with the Spirit of God. Jesus breathed on his disciples the Spirit of God.
So some of what you heard there would be the same thing you would hear here. Uh, as we were talking, you know, I didn't catch this in the interview, but I just said, hey, that's exactly what, what you do every day, praying for the Holy Spirit to lead you and to have the Holy Spirit use you. That's exactly what I teach our people at Resurrection to do. And I hope that you have heard many times that Christ is our Savior and to yield your life to him and to accept his gift of salvation. I mean, these are things that we all share in common. And, uh, and then the idea of the Holy Spirit uh, giving him the gift of tongues. So uh, in the Pentecostal movement, you look at the, it's seen that you're filled with the Holy Spirit when you receive Christ. And then there's this next action that can happen where the Holy Spirit immerses you, where you're baptized in the Holy Spirit and you begin to speak in these other languages. And it's thought in many of the Pentecostal churches that that is the evidence that you have been baptized in the Holy Spirit. And this is a place where Pastor Cave and I would disagree. Now, I, again, I came to faith in his church. I, I received the experience that he described. I was baptized in the Holy Spirit. I spoke in tongues. My pastor taught me to do that. I, you know, taught me what that was like and what to expect. And over a period of four or five years, you know, I would routinely pray in that way, the way he's describing. So I appreciate it. And as United Methodists, we don't, uh, we don't say that's not possible. We say it is possible. There are denominations and Southern Baptists are some and, and Nazarenes are some and there's others who, you know, who really say, well, no, this is not for today. That was only for back then. And it really had to do with a particular expression of tongues. But you know, for United Methodists, we say, of course, that's possible. This, you know, this, God could do that too. But part of what we ask is, is that as helpful today as it might have been in the first century? And in particular, in the context of a worship service. So Paul begins to talk about this as a private language, a sort of prayer language that we can have with the Holy Spirit. And just to give you some idea of what it's like, um, when you speak in tongues, what you do is you're, at least this is how I experienced it, is you're liberating your tongue from your mind. That is, you're not limited in your praying to grammar and syntax and vocabulary that you know in the English language. Instead, you begin to speak in syllables or multiple syllabic words that have no meaning. They're, Paul describes as groaning too deep for words. And so you begin to be able to express to God your praise or your concerns or your burdens without being limited to normal grammar, syntax, and vocabulary. So that can be quite beautiful and refreshing. And, and at the same time, uh, what I found over a period of four years, it wasn't a huge dramatic experience for me. It was a very sort of, this is what my pastor taught, you know, we should do. And, and over time, I eventually was able to do that. And, and, uh, and I enjoyed that to some degree, that kind of being able to pray freed up in that way. But over time, I came to appreciate much more being able to know what I was saying and to be able to express what was on my heart and my mind in words that I did understand. Now, one of the challenges in, in Pentecostalism is a sort of subjectivism where, uh, where you have this direct encounter with the Holy Spirit. But the problem is that we as human beings, spiritually, we're a little hard of hearing and our hearts are also, you know, things come to our heart filtered through our own sin, our own ideas, our own, uh, you know, our own identity. And so it's interesting, there are times where somebody can feel like the Holy Spirit gave them a message. And that message may or may not actually have come from the Holy Spirit. Because again, we're hard of hearing and we tend to hear things through our own biases. So in a, uh, in a progressive church that's also charismatic or Pentecostal, uh, they may just very well have a message that says that Kamala Harris is gonna be the next president, thus saith the Lord. And you go to a much more conservative Pentecostal church and they are really clear that Donald Trump is the anointed. And Really, both of those are people who are hearing the Holy Spirit through the lens of their own political biases. We find there's a tendency sometimes within Pentecostal and charismatic churches for charlatans to arise, people who will manipulate other people by saying God gave them this message and told them to do this. And those are some of the dangers. And pastors like Pastor Bob Cave are aware of that, and they're very careful about this. But, but it is something that can happen where people can take advantage of, can spiritually abuse or manipulate or misuse things that they say are from God, but really are from themselves. So one thing that you'll notice here is I never ever have said to you, God told me to tell you this. I don't say that individually. I don't say that as a pastor standing in front of you. What I, what I hope to do is to accurately convey what I think the Holy Spirit is saying through the scriptures and to you. And when I'm meeting with you one-on-one, -on -one, you know, I might say, I feel like maybe God is telling me to share this with you. But I'm never gonna say, I know God told me because I know I'm spiritually hard of hearing and I may not get it right. One of you asked this question, you know, how do we know whether it's the Holy Spirit or us? And the truth is we can't be 100% certain. And that's good for you to know that. So it may be the Spirit's touching you and prompting you, but it's also may be that your own thoughts are entering into that as well. And so we test whatever we feel like the Holy Spirit is telling us in the light of Scripture, and in particular, in the light of the person of Jesus. And then we carry it with humility to be able to say, I feel like this may be where God is leading, or I think this is what God wants me to say to you. I can't be sure. This is what I think. 
And I think if we, if we carry that humility with us, then we have the best of both. We have the ability to say, I think the Holy Spirit has said this, but I could be wrong about that. All right, so finally, I, want to, I just want to uh, recognize that in Corinth, Paul was concerned because the Christians there seemed to be overly excited about these ecstatic gifts. And so at one point in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, he starts trying to tamp that down just a little bit. And he starts giving them some rules and how they exercise these spiritual gifts. And then he gets to the end of 1 Corinthians 12 and he says, now I will show you a more excellent way, a more excellent way than all the spiritual gifts that he's been talking about in 1 Corinthians 12. And this is what he says. If I speak in tongues of mortals or of human beings and of angels, but I don't have love, I'm a clanging gong or a clashing cymbal. And if I have the gift of prophecy and I know all the mysteries and everything else, and if I have such complete faith that I can move mountains, but I don't have love, I'm nothing. If I give away everything that I have and hand over my own body to feel good about what I've done, but I don't have love, I receive no benefit whatsoever. And that's really where I want us to leave today in this message. Because I want us to recognize that ultimately what the Holy Spirit is meant to do is produce in us love. We are meant to be instruments of God's love. We are meant to receive God's love and to reciprocate God's love to God and to one another. We're meant to be able to love not only our neighbors, but also our enemies, to love people who are on the other side of the political aisle, that the Holy Spirit is meant to produce that. And if you uh, claim to have the Holy Spirit and you can speak in tongues, you can do all these other things, but you aren't loving, you have misunderstood what the Holy Spirit was trying to do in your life. And which of us doesn't need to be more loving? This is what it means to be recreated into the people God intended for us to be. That's the Spirit's work, is to recreate us and restore us. And to restore us means to help us be like God, in whose image we were created. And John tells us that God is love. That is the work of the Holy Spirit primarily in our lives, is not only to make us more loving, but to help us exercise love towards other people. So this is where I want to end. In my life, I pray for the Holy Spirit every day to guide me, shape me, form me, make me, use me, and minister through me. And then I try to pay attention. And paying attention means I recognize every day when I leave my house, I'm on a mission. Actually, even in my own house with LaVon, my animals, I'm on a mission. When I'm walking through my neighborhood, I'm on a mission. Lord, use me today. Help me to pay attention. And when I act that way, when I live that way, and then I'm inviting the Holy Spirit to lead me, I'm just paying attention all the time. I'm watching to see, is there somebody who looks like they need a helping hand? Is there somebody who needs a word of encouragement? Somebody just needs a smile, right? Who, who needs that? I mean, and so many times, even in my own neighborhood, when I take my morning walks, you know, and I have a chance to talk to one of my neighbors or, or to pray for every one of my neighbors when I walk by their houses or, or I see somebody who looks like they're discouraged. I mean, all of those are opportunities. When I'm here at church on Sunday, same thing. I mean, this is true every day of the week. So when I gather here, I look around the room to see who looks sad in here. Who looks like they're all alone and I need to go find them and get to talk to them. I try to do that between the services. When I get done with the service, so I may have shared this before, I give the benediction and as I'm giving the benediction, I'm walking out during the benediction. So I get out there to, uh, to the, the parking lot before anybody else. But what I know, the reason why I do that is because there are people who are hightailing it out of church even while I'm giving the closing prayer because they don't want to see anybody because they've been crying because there's something you know, broken in their lives and, and maybe they were here for the very first time. And so I look around there and I'll see four or five people and I, and I just, I pray like, which one should I go after? And then I, I finally, I, for, well, the one, in the, the one in the striped shirt. And then I go running after the one in the striped shirt and I get out there and I, you know, they're already halfway to their car and I tap them on the shoulder and say, hey, I just wanted to say, thank you so much for coming to church today. That's all I say. And they look at me, they're kind of shocked. And sometimes they're a little nervous, like, wait, the preacher came ran, running after me. And I'm like, I didn't really need anything else. I just wanted you to know that. And sometimes they say, well, thank you so much. I can't believe you came running after me. And sometimes tears well up in their eyes. Like, I can't believe you came to find me. Right? And, and then they start pouring out right there in the parking lot. They pour out what happened this last week that caused them to go to church for the first time in 10 years. And and, you know, by the time we're finished, I have a momentary prayer with them and I hug them and I say, okay, could you, would you mind doing this next? Call the church here, or do this. And, but what I find is almost always every weekend, there are encounters I have that I know were spirit-led, prompted in my heart, and I had an opportunity to be an instrument of God's love and grace. I could tell you hundreds, thousands of stories like that. But the key is to invite the Holy Spirit to work in you and then to pay attention and then to be willing to chase after the one who needs your love. I want us to be Christians who are filled with the Holy Spirit and daily living in the power and presence of the Holy Spirit in our lives. So I'm going to invite you to do this. Would you put your hands on your lap like this? And I'd like for us to pray. Just say these words, if you would. Fill me, Holy Spirit. Fill me to overflowing. Form me and shape me. 
produce your fruit in me. Grant me your gifts for ministry. Help me to pay attention. Empower me to do your work. I offer my life to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for watching this week's sermon. We'd love for you to join us again in worship online or in person. To learn more about Church of the Resurrection, you can visit core.org. Have a great week, and we hope to see you next time.